Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand before the Lord. It's good to have those of you that are here on time and those that are on their way. God is good all the time. Amen. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise? I am glad he is alive and I serve him and he loves me. I know he loves you. Amen. If there's somebody next to you, take their hand if you don't mind. And let's, uh, if there's nobody right there just yet, there probably will be in a little while, but grab the angel, the hand of an angel. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask you, Lord, to have your way this morning as we come to exalt your name. Your name is a name that is above all names. There is none like you. You're worthy to be exalted and worthy to be praised. Lord, I thank you, Father, for those that are here and those that are on their way. Be with those that are sick, God, right now. Father, we agree against this stomach virus thing that has hit so many people, Lord. We just come against them. We just declare the healing blood of Jesus Christ right now. Lord, we pray for those online that are watching today that you will minister to them, that your word will be truth and alive, that the music will please your ear and your heart, Lord. Father, that the worshipers will arise, that your name will be glorified. Father, we lay down everything in our own thoughts, in our week, in our minds. We lay it down before the cross, and we say this is the prime time, your time. Lord, we lay down everything except for lifting you up, Father. Have your way this morning, O oh God. In Jesus' name. Let's just do that. Close your eyes if you would. Just begin to love him for me. And all through the house, come on. Just begin to shift your focus towards him. And, and this is a, a, the, the time of the week that we get to just come and join together and exalt him. So, Father, we praise you right now. And we invite you to fill this house to overflowing with your glory. Let the river run through this house. Father, anoint the singers, anoint the worship team, anoint everyone, Father, with your goodness. For we come to praise you. We come to praise you. If you're standing by somebody, just pray for them right now that God will touch them in the midst of this service today. Hallelujah. Father, have your way. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. the Lord this morning. If you guys can, you can come up to these altars or come up to the, the aisles. Let's just go after the Lord this morning. God, we thank you for joy in this house, God. We ask that your joy fills this room, Jesus. Right now, in Jesus' name, your joy, God, your peace, God, your freedom, Jesus. We come. 
If you need that this morning, just begin to close your eyes and lift your hands. If you need peace this morning, while you worship, let him, let him just soak you with his peace. Let him soak you with his joy. Just begin to focus on Jesus. Because I know that sometimes we can just sit and we can just wait, you know, we can wait on something, but sometimes we need to do something. We need that action. We need to let God know how much he means to us. God, you're worthy of me standing. You're worthy of me kneeling. You're worthy of me dancing. You're worthy of me singing out loud, even though it's kind of scary. You're worthy of me talking to you out loud. You're worthy of me just clapping my hands or lifting my hands. 
God, you're worthy, Jesus. Come on, just begin to tell him how much he means to you this morning. And if you came in here just weary, maybe just heavy, maybe just tired, you know, maybe you've just been kind of going nonstop and you're like, God, I can't keep up. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm drowning. Just begin to look at Jesus. Let him find you this morning. God, make us like kids again. Give us that childlike spirit, God, where we're just playing hide and seek with our Father, Lord. God, it says, if we seek you, we find you, God. So God, we seek you this morning, Jesus. We seek you, we seek you with the weariness. We seek you with the tiredness. We seek you with the lack of sleep. We, we seek you with, with the just keep going, the, the, the weariness, the heaviness. We seek you even with all of that. Because you see your kids, God. You see your children. You see your sons and daughters, God. And you know where every single person is at in this place. You know every individual story. It's not this vague thing where it's like, you know, everyone gets the same word. Everyone gets the same thing. You know, he loves us all uniquely. He loves, loves us all with the same amount, but he loves us all uniquely. So just begin to worship him in your own way this morning. Let him touch you in his own way. However he wants to speak to you this morning, just begin to focus on Jesus this morning. Oh, Jesus, we lift you high, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus.
worship him in our own way this morning. Just begin to sing to him, begin to talk to him. step into a place with the Lord and we can hear his heart we can hear the cry of his voice to the people there's an anointing on this song right now something very strong is going on I, I've got a prophetic word for you in a few minutes so uh, Isabella but uh, there's atmospheres that we create in the presence of God if you go to a doctor, you're sitting there waiting, but when you go in the room, you want his or her undivided attention, am I right? I mean, that's what goes on. We want them to spend that time with us. That's what's going on right now in this house. And I give it to you the best way I could describe it. You're sitting in the waiting room, and Dr. Jesus is back there calling names one by one. And then the nurse says, he's got room for everybody. So when you're ready, you just come on. He's waiting on you. I'm going to tell you, I've been in many doctor offices, and I get, I get really bored sitting out there in that waiting room. And the moment they call my name, an excitement jumps as a man. I can get back there and, and see my doctor's a female. I get to see her. I want to get her attention. Well, there's enough of Jesus for everybody. Are you hearing me? Now, we have to move from the waiting room to the examining room. That's that room where the doctor comes in and it's just you and the doctor. Now, I know God can meet you where you are. I know he can. But I also know there's these things called steps of faith where God said to the children of Israel, you want to have a victory, you got to cross this sea over here. He said to the rest of them, the next journey, he says, you want to have victory over the enemy, you got to cross through this Jordan. Many times we had to do something different than we've done before. Israel was in straits one time. The enemy would steal their harvest every year. Every single year, their harvest, they'd plant their harvest in the fields, and the Philistines would come out of the mountains and take their food. And when they did, they'd get what they could get, and then they'd go run and hide in the caves because they were scared to death they were going to die. And there was a guy that said, you know what, I'm tired, of, I'm tired of running from the enemy. I'm tired of being afraid. And when Israel starts running from the fields because the Philistines are coming, this guy stood up and ran to the field. And he stood in the midst of a field of lentils. And he drew his sword, and he says, I'm not going nowhere. I'm here to stay. Is anybody hearing me? Sometimes, tell somebody next to you, sometimes we've got to do something different. Now, I'm telling you, 
I'm asking Isabel to do this song again and they'll go wherever they go. But the anointing is on it. The presence of God is here. And many Christians have never tasted the sweetness of his presence. They, they serve him. They love him. They know he loves them. They know they're forgiven. But to take that step to say, I want to be in that intimate place with you where it's just you and me. So here's what I'm going to say. As they're leading this worship song one more time or two more times or whatever we do, I feel God is saying for some of you, you need to come up here and just kneel down or stand up. But do something different and say, here I am, God. I'm coming to worship you. I'm coming to touch your throne. I can feel surges of his presence just Isabella, when you were singing that, just hitting me over and over and over. I thought you were going to explode at one time. I was saying, prophesy, preach, do anything you want. This isn't some, let's try to force you. This is some, the doctor said, there's room. The doctor says there's room for your one-on-one -on -one time with me. And so, as they begin to sing, you want to shift? You want something else? Just come up here. Get in his presence. If you can't come and kneel and you can't come and stand, bring a chair. I don't care. But just get in his presence for the next few minutes. Come on. It's yours. It's well. Go. And if God tells you to say something, do something, prophesy, do backflips. Whatever you feel to do, girl, do it.
You and him. You and him.
this is where I'm meant to be. Oh, me and you and you and me. I don't have and I don't have to prove a thing. You've already approved of me. This is where, this is where I'm meant to be. It 
God did a, a big thing right here, guys. A miracle. A big thing. My God, my God, my God. This is where I'm meant to be. Jesus. Me and you, and you and me. And I don't have to pray. There's nothing God cannot do. This is where I'm meant to be. Jesus, Jesus, Me Jesus. and you and you and me. I don't have, and I don't have to prove a thing. There's nothing too hard for our God. Come on, if you believe that, say, Jesus, there's nothing too hard for you. Come on, tell him. There's nothing too hard for you. I'm not stopping it. Me and you and you and Jesus, me. Jesus, I Jesus. Have, and I don't, I don't have, have to prove a thing. My God, my God, my You've God. You've already approved of me. But this is where I'm meant to be. Yes. Oh, me and you and you and me. And I don't have to prove
Jesus. Father, we thank you that you love us, that you love us. Just, can we stay there? Do you have another song? Is this it? Just, just stay on this song, or, unless you feel like God tells you something different. Um, I've, I've got to say this. This is so strong. I was standing back there, and I didn't want to look at anybody else in the church. I'm looking around and seeing you. And the reason I didn't want to keep looking because I just kept getting bombarded. Listen to me close. With your destiny. The prophetic word of God over your life. Say this right now if you would. I'm walking out my destiny in God. I'm telling you, you are. You, you can feel like you're not, but you are in the prophetic destiny of the, the Holy Spirit. You're, you're in the prophetic uh, words. In Psalms 139 he says, when you were being formed in your mother's womb I wrote a book of prophecy about your life. It's in the Bible. I didn't make that up. He told Jeremiah, before you are in your mother's womb I knew you. And then in Psalms 139 it says before you were even finished being formed, I, I wrote about your life. And what God showed me as I was looking out at the congregation, I looked at individuals and God said, I have destiny for them. Listen to me close. This isn't new. You know this. But the enemy wants to stop that destiny of God. Do you hear me? And it's not hard to stay in the destiny of God. You just hold his hand. Now, Caleb, I hope you're hearing me online. I'm assuming you're adjusting sound back there. But God said to tell you, son, he is not done with you yet. That's his word to you today. Caleb Rabion, God is not done with you. And there are things that he still has prepared for you to do. And he wants you to grab a hold and say, here I am, God, send me, use me. Caleb Rabion, God says, I am not done with you yet. Come on. Isabella, God spoke to me as you were singing, and he said, as you were standing here, I mean, literally, I was waiting for you, waiting, and you started really going, so I, I know you were in that zone, but... You could preach, you could prophesy, you could do all that stuff in the midst of it. But God said to tell you, no matter what it looks like or how things are going, and I know some things, so I want to get me out of the equation. He said, you are in the perfect will of God. You are so aligned up with him. It's, I saw literally a white line, and you're in the middle of a white line, and that white line is God's perfected will and destiny you're walking it out right now so don't doubt anything don't fear anything don't say man what is going on don't even worry at anything even your future none of it you have to think about nothing just here enjoy it enjoy life and do the stuff because you are in a beam of the perfect destiny plan of God that's where you're at amen come on give the Lord some praise you receive that? I know you receive that. You'd be crazy if you didn't. That there is prophetic promise. Listen to me. God. God does not just let you survive. He gives life when we're born. He speaks over that life. My God. Dalton, don't go yet. Can I tell them what I saw about the angels? We're good? Now, I know, I know he hadn't been in church, so I know he's been doing some things he probably should not have do. I don't keep up with him, but I just went, you know, I've seen him in the past and some things, and, you know, it's, it's all good on my end. But Shannon and Amy, I want you to know something. God's not abandoned that young man. 
And there were some times in the last few months that he almost died. He was close to being taken out. And I saw four angels standing around him. And they were guarding his life because he's a child of the king. Come on, give God a hand of praise. I'm not making this stuff up. I know what I saw, and God has been protecting that young man. You're going to have to tell your parents what God did up here because that was a lot went on. Broke the back of the enemy by the power of the Holy Ghost. Look at somebody next to you and say, you're no accident. Look across the aisle the other way and say, you're no accident. God has plans for you and a destiny. We think it's so complicated sometimes to figure out what God's will is. Let me tell you, it is not that easy if you are his son or daughter to get out of his will. Because he's fighting for you. He'll take your will and twist it to end it up his will. But to stay on that place. Now, can you ruin it? Sure you can. You can walk as far away from him as you want. You can, you can destroy your faith. But I'm telling you, if you're afraid of what your future holds, you grab a hold of the hand of Jesus and say, I'm going to serve you through it. And that's all you've got to do. You don't have to worry about anything. Just say, I've got my hand in the hand of the man who knows the plan, who made the plan. His name is Jesus. Come on, if you can receive that, give him the biggest shout of praise that you can. Come on, give him the biggest shout of praise. Matter of fact, can we just stand up and just give him a shout? Because he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Give him the best you've got. Give him all that you have. Come on, if you're at home, stand up right now. <laughs> he is worthy. Jesus. Jesus. Sound the alarm. Trumpet in Zion. Yes. My God, he is so worthy. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We worship you. Don't be afraid, little children, says the Lord. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Don't worry, for I am here, says God. If you're dealing with fear, worry, anxiety, all those things. I want you just to tell him right now, I give them to you. And I grab a hold of your hand. I grab a hold of your love. Even when we make a mess out of it, he says, I'm not leaving. I love you. Even when we doubt and we fear, we get angry, you might say things and do things you shouldn't do. He says, I'm still here. My arms are stretched out wide. I love you. Doesn't excuse our sin, but it doesn't stop his love. <laughs> Paul said, nothing will separate us from the love of our God. He's ever reaching out. Do that dead things back to life again. Sorry. Ooh. I listened to Dalton was singing that, man. He was singing that part. I said, go sing it. We got to get some of this stuff back inside of us. I know we're going to change the order in a minute, but I'm just stuck in a spot with Jesus. Come on, King.
I want you to speak to the dead things that are supposed to be alive and say, you're coming back to life. My joy is coming back to life. My peace is coming back to life. My destiny is coming back to life. Come on. Come on. dry bones. Feels so good to know Come on. All through this building, just do it. Speak to those things the enemy said are failures that will never work. Come on. Because you are closer, closer Jesus. than my skin. And you Sing it one more time. So Come on. Let your faith rise up. Let your faith rise up. Speak to the, the dry bones of the past and say, you're coming back to life. Those callings. Those visions right now, we call them back to life. Declaration. Here's where the dead is. Right now. Come back to live. Come on. I feel my heart beating again. It feels so good to know you are my friend. Cause you are closer, closer than my skin. Start receiving right now. He's touching somebody. He's touching somebody right now. Some things that you thought were dead and buried. He's bringing it back to life. The heart is beginning to beat again. so good. resuscitating some areas in some lives. Just receive him right now. And here's where the dead right now, they're coming back. Come back to living. I feel more beating again. It feels so good to know you Praise God.
We honor your name in this house today, oh God. You're here. Your presence is hovering over this building. We thank you because we don't deserve it. Thank you for your love, your peace, your mercy, and your strength. In Jesus' mighty name. Give him one more big hand. He's worth it. <laughs> you can be seated this morning. Dalton, can I say something to you? I'm going to be a dad for a minute. Or in your case, a paw paw. I don't know how that happened. I'm, I don't feel like I'm a pawpaw. Hey, I got a compliment. I called a guy the other day, and um, he was on the phone, and he called me back, and he asked me questions about business, and he said, how old are you? I said, I'm 63. He said, you sound like you're 35 on the phone. I said, man, thank you. It gets better. I went to see him. He told his wife, he says, that guy's 63, but he looks like he's in his mid-50s. I said, thank you, Jesus. God is so good. Dalton, listen to me. And most of the young men, I want you guys and young ladies, listen to me. If you're, oh, let's say, I'm going to change your age because this is a different world we live in. If you're under 22, I'm speaking to you, male or female. You don't have to be the man or the woman. You got to grow up, but you can still be young at heart. You don't have to perform like some people might say, you know, you, you got to be this or you, no one can tell you what to do or this or that, you know, and, and you feel this pressure that you got to be a woman or a man, be a child in Christ and rely on the people around you and they'll help you grow. But don't be afraid. I, there's a picture, my cousin who calls me her uncle in Texas took a picture of her husband. How old is Jared? What would you say? Jared's 43. His wife took a picture of him yesterday sleeping on the couch with a stuffed animal. What was that thing? It's a um, hulk, with a, a stuffed animal hulk. A grown man, how old? 43, sleeping with his arm around a hulk. Now I know he was probably just not like finding security and it was probably just like a pillow, but the picture was great. He's probably going to get her, I'm sure. But sometimes, guys, we don't have to carry the pressure of being all grown up. Release that pressure and just love God and let others guide us on the journey. We need each other. How many adults in here don't need anybody else? Raise your hand. <laughs> Look around, young people. We need each other. I call my son-in-laws, I call my grandsons sometimes for, for instruction and things. We're allowed to do that. Let's rely on each other. Can we do that? Amen. Beautiful worship. The last two songs, Isabella about took me out. I'm almost left here. Um, Pastor Mark is going to come receive the offering. Also, I have some announcements. Tomorrow night uh, is our um, outreach it happens to be on Halloween night. That's because uh, it worked out that way. <laughs> Kids will be out walking the streets with adults, and we're going to have uh, uh, trailers set up and worship going on and uh, trunks with candy and 
hot dogs and drinks and a prayer tent. And if it all works out, we might even, uh, someone wanted to get baptized. I don't know if they still do or not, but we might even bring the baptism out there. We'll do it at the end because so, they're going to be a little cold, but it'll be pretty cool. We used to do water baptisms almost every Halloween night, huh, Pastor Marcus? So, but I'm going to bring some of those announcements in just a few minutes. Pastor Mark is going to come receive the offering. And can we give Jesus one more hand, please? Good morning, family. Look at somebody next to you and say, hey, you look good today. Just tell them. Yeah, you do? Because I see some of you today that I didn't see last week or the week before. And so we, lately we've been running a little thin on folks. Uh, lots of things going on and activities and such as that. And, uh, of course, I'll be honest with you, when people aren't here, it does affect our offering a little bit. But I'll get to that in a moment. I want to read you one of the most ridiculous stories that Jesus ever said. Y'all want to hear it? Y'all want to hear it? I got it in my phone right here. It's just a verse. I'm going to read you this verse. Check this out. This is in Luke chapter 15, verse 4. Jesus said, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? Now that might seem like the most ridiculous example of God's love that you've ever heard of, and it probably is. Why would you leave ninety-nine to go chase after one? In theory, you're like, well, hey, I'll just make sure I can protect the 99. The one's on his own. He decided to be stupid. Let him go. We do that, don't we, as human beings. That's kind of like, well, you won't be dumb, you know. But when Jesus is talking about that, he's talking about something a little more important. He's talking about souls. And I can tell you, it's a ridiculous example until you're the one. Right? How many of you can say you've been the one before? Yeah. So in this church this morning... We took a lot of extra time for one, and I am not mad about it. Now, there was others, don't get me wrong, but it started with one, didn't it, Pastor? It started with one. And I got to be honest with you, I love that young man right over there. He drives me nuts. And there's some days that I want to take him out, but I want him here. And I probably can speak for his parents. They probably feel the same way, right? told him that. Be worth the time and the effort. And that being said, this church will always be a hospital for the soul. And we're always going to take time for one. Because that's what's important at the moment for the heart of God. And today, that's what was important. And some of you might be looking at your clock thinking, man, you're ready to go or you might be getting anxious or things of that nature. But I'm going to tell you something. You might feel that way, but if you're the one, you don't feel that way. You want everybody joining in and helping. And so I appreciate those of you that have focused in and prayed this morning and supported as we prayed. There were several up here, of course. It wasn't just all. We're teasing him a little bit. But uh, a lot of history there with that fellow over there. And uh, so it's it's good to see some, some th good things happening. So, But this church will always be that. We're always going to be the ones crazy enough to chase the one. And if it takes a little extra time and we're a little late for lunch or worship goes a little bit longer, that's who we are. We're just trying to follow Jesus' example. And that's kind of what we're supposed to be doing anyway. Yeah. So, I'm going to piggyback off of that and say this last thing. The last few weeks, we've been missing a lot of our brothers and sisters in the church. And you look around, there's quite a few seats empty today. We've got a few more today than we did last week. And I, and I want to tell you, when, when you're not here, it affects us all in a lot of ways. Obviously, emotionally, we like to see you. Sometimes this is the only time we see one another. I, I can tell you there's a lot of you in this room. This is the only time you see me. Of course, you might be glad about that. But if you're not, <laughs> I'm just telling you, this is the only time we get to connect and say, hi, how are you doing? Can I help? Can I support you? Can I do anything for you? And, I, and, 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 I, and I'm, and I'm going to say this part because the Lord told me to do this this morning when I was thinking about you guys. Do you need anything? Are you okay? Do you need something? If, you need, if you're in need today, come see us, okay? Because I'm going to be honest with you, in this church, we're, we're in need right now. We really are. But I believe you reap what you sow. Can I get an amen? 
And if you're in need today, come see us. We want to help your need. Because we want to sow and we want to reap. Because we know the promises of God. And I can tell you right now, we're in a weird place in church this week. For the last few weeks, it's been a little bit, it's been getting a little narrow. And so, and I am not putting pressure on anybody today, but I am asking you to pray with us. We do need to see either people in seats or some things to come in financially because uh, it's it's pretty, I don't know who gives, don't know who get. it's none of my business. I will never look at it because I don't want to know. I don't want to be looking over it and somebody wondering why they didn't tie this week. I, I, don't, I don't need that in my life, right? That's between you and God. But I will say that there's been a shortfall uh, for several weeks, and it's kind of caught up with us, and we're a bit of a pinch. And so we need your prayers. Yes, we need your dollars, but we don't need you going crazy today and not paying your mortgage this week. And, you know, unless God tells you to do it, don't you do nothing crazy. But I am going to say this. We're going to do something with our gifts today that's a little bit different. We're gonna, we're gonna, we always lift our gifts before the king and we pray and we bless him. But today, we're going to do something and stand together in faith and we're going to believe for provision from God for this house. Can we do that? So it's not just about us today. It's about this body. And you say, well, I've been giving mine and I'm good and you might be. But today, I want you to agree together for your brothers and sisters in this room. Because it's been when there's a shortfall like this, it's not just one or two people, it's multiple. And we believe that's an attack of the enemy. Can I get a shout from somebody? And so we're going to stand together against the enemy. Can we do that? So that being said, whatever God has put in your heart today, I want you to get it in your hand. And you say, well, maybe, maybe this is the week you don't have anything. Well, I'm going to challenge you. Get that empty hand ready right now because we need you. We need you to believe with us. Okay? And y'all know, I don't get on this soapbox like this around here, but I'm doing it today because we really are in a spot, okay? And it's a little interesting. Yeah, if you don't have anything, ask somebody, hey, you got something I can give. You're right like that. <laughs> She's like, here, here's it. So, so let's do it right now. Let's get our gifts together. Matter of fact, I've got mine. My wife gave it to me a moment ago. Praise Jesus. So if you've got a gift or you don't have a gift, are you ready now? And we're going to do something a little different. We're going to lift it up, but I also want you to stand and lift it at the same time because we can do this in unity, okay? Is that okay? So why don't you rise to you after you've written your checks or whatever you've got, rise to your feet if you can, and I want you to lift that gift before the king just like this, okay? And you don't have anything, I challenge you. And I need your empty hand right now because we want to agree together, okay? And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to keep beating up the point, but let's do it right now. Let's agree together, and let's begin to pray that this gift that we've so this sowing right now will be reaping in this entire building because somebody in here needs this. Father, we lift these gifts before you and we stand together in unity. Precious Father, we ask that you meet the needs of this house. You know the situation. You know where we're at. Nothing has come to you by surprise. So, Lord, I know you've set this out so that we can step out in faith together. We are believing today together for blessings, not for us, but for our neighbor right now, for our family member in this house. Father, we're believing for one another that provision will come in. Father, we thank you that you've given us something, but Lord, I'm I'm putting mine in today, and I'm believing everybody else is putting theirs in today, not believing that, Lord, that you will come supernaturally in my house, but that you will bless every other house in here because of what I am doing. So, Father, I am believing right now as I place this in here today, that the needs of every single person in this place will be met. Father, I am not giving for my sake today, but I am giving for my brothers and sisters today. And you know the needs, Lord. We pray with us, with me, with your eye now, everybody with a good gift, right? I say, Jesus, thank you that I can give. Jesus, I give this on behalf of my family. And Jesus, I thank you for meeting their needs and blessing this house in Jesus' name. If you believe, if you believe what we pray today, won't you shout amen? The Bible says we're to be cheerful givers, and I'm going to ask you to be real cheerful today. It's now time to give the offering.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Glory. God is so good. Uh oh, hang on, Brother Ronald. Amen. Thank you, Brother Allen. For those that don't know, he just promoted the Givelify thing, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, it, it's automatic on his. Amen. <clears throat> don't you love the Lord? Do you know that everybody can give? <clears throat> I remember, I'll tell you two quick stories. I'm going to share the word. I, the word won't be long tonight, today. I don't, you know, we're going to get you out by three like normal. Um, but, uh, Everybody can give. There is. Thank you. Give these guys a hand, the whole worship team, if you would. <clears throat> Amen. I came in and uh, some young man didn't have a job. Uh, he doesn't work full time. I, I think he might have been, um, I don't know, what, eight years old or so, seven years old, young man with my sister in the back. And I looked at him and. He gave me a, 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 what is this, a, a set, they, he called it a satsuma, is that what it was, a satsuma, I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah, smells like one. Um, smells like one. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes when we don't have anything to give, we can still give. Do you know that in the Hebrew world of the Jewish people, giving is a part of worship. Bring me down just a teeny bit, if you would, uh, Sarah. Giving is a part of worship. That's why they want to give it regular. Tell them thank you. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> the Bible says, come taste and see that I am good. That's really good. <laughs> Seedless good. I'm going to finish it if you don't mind. <laughs> What's that got to do the message, Pastor Dave? Thank you. Thank you. Right here. Thank you. I'll keep this. Thank you. Let me just say this. That was a really good satsuma. Um, how many in here know what it tasted like? No, you don't. You, you're lying. You think you do. Yeah, how, it might have been sour. You don't know because it was mine. I'm going to tell I didn't share it. It was all mine. I just want to say this to you, that... The sweetness of God's presence is for individuals. It's, it's theirs. He's personal. He doesn't just pour out a blanket like M&M's and say, everybody eat M&M's and it all tastes the same because some people don't like them. He gives us what we need and he loves us. He's a God of individuality and he will give you the sweetness of his goodness. We've just got to open the door to let him do it. We really do. And we can sit back and we can you know, talk about him or we can, you know, be halfway in, halfway out. But I am telling you, when we dive in all the way, and the only way I know how to do that is surrender everything. Would everybody agree? Surrender my fears, my attitudes, my angers, my life, whatever. But when you surrender everything to him, he has sweetness for you to eat that you've never had before. Amen. <clears throat> Real quick, and I'm going to bring the word this morning. Uh, tomorrow evening at 5.30, we're having our toys, our toys for tots. A lot of stuff going on. Tomorrow evening at 5.30 starts uh, Halloween night. Kids will be out. We're going to be set up across from Regions Bank, right next to Jacob's Well. Beautiful parking lot. I went by the yesterday. So excited. All that rain. Did you get any rain yesterday? 
that parking lot was dry. I mean, had a few puddles, but a perfect location. We're going to set our trailer up there. We have electricity from the building next door to us. Uh, we so appreciate it. So um, if you're a part of that, please uh, dive in and help us. Please read your bulletins. We still need candy. We need hot dogs, all that type of stuff. So if you have any candy or hot dogs or anything you can give, please uh, get a hold of Sister Tammy. Let her know. She's been on the phone all week trying to get uh, some help. We're having a prayer station. Oh, I'm, I'm, let me read it. There will be live music and testimonies. That's awesome. Hot dogs and drinks, candy, a prayer station, a photo booth, okay, and trunk or treat for the kids. And uh, if I get calls, we will have a baptism. I'll just wait on them. But uh, we'll be setting up, uh, starting setting up tomorrow. And then remember the Toys for Tots. Uh, please stay in touch with those and get go online and, and just uh, connect with what's going on, all of our dates and things that are happening, um, because it's, it's a lot of beautiful stuff. Uh, great outreach. Our drama is coming along pretty good. I'm pretty proud of everybody that's in the program. Awesome job. Amen. So please read your bulletins. Go online, check it out, Facebook, go to Toys for Tots online, all that. Just get a hold of everything, and we need you to dive in. This is a great opportunity to minister. Uh, Isabella, how many testimonies do we have so far? Okay. Um, we're, listen to me close. We're going to be right in the middle of town on a stage, and we want people to share their story. you got five minutes to share it. And so show up tomorrow night, get with Isabella. And Dalton, you raise your hand. You're going you're gonna to give your testimony? Okay, don't write Dalton down. Um, this isn't for teenagers. This is for anybody. We're limiting it to five minutes, but we've got three hours out there. We're going to do some worship and praise, and then we're going to have some uh, testimonies. And one of the great things about this is going to be it's giving you an opportunity to get outside the four walls of the church and to share Jesus in the streets on a microphone. So break that fear barrier. That you're not going to mess it up. If you take two minutes, it does not matter. It's a, it's a stepping stone to a pathway of the, the witnessing for Jesus Christ. Amen. So how many is excited about that? Can you give the Lord a hand? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with your Bible in your hand. Um, uh, and I want to thank all of you for, for standing with us today and seeing what God has done. Say this with an attitude of faith. An attitude of faith, say this, this is the Word of God. Everything that says I am, I am. Everything that says I can do, I can do. Everything that says I have, I have. When I hide it in my heart and let it be formed in my mouth, when I speak it in faith, it unleashes the creative power of God that causes me to walk in Victory, success, deliverance, healing, and prosperity. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Amen. You got something? What's her name? Carol? Come on, Kara. Give her a hand. Kara, congratulations, girl. Amen. We love it. I like how Joyce introduced her, a sister in Christ. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Acts. Amen. I'm going to try my best to keep my focus here. The book of Acts. I had two messages today, and uh, I ended up with this one. Just seemed to jump off the page a little bit. I was using two Bibles, so sometimes we get mixed up when we do that. But the book of Acts, chapter 27... Amen. And I want to start with verse 10, and we're going to bounce around a little bit. <clears throat> Father, bless your word this morning. Make, make it alive. Let it resonate inside somebody's heart today, God, and let my words be your words. Let your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a, a gentleman named Paul, or the Apostle Paul. He has been arrested and he is on his way to Rome to be judged and sentenced uh, in a court of law. On the way there, he's traveling by ship. 
And it doesn't really matter. And he's being judged because of preaching the gospel of Christ. And I'm just going to say that sometimes the journey that we're on is not an easy one. Can anybody say amen to that? And it says, so uh, Saul, they got on this ship and, you know, the prisoners are there and, and uh, they're traveling. And I want to start with verse 10. It says in uh, verse tw chapter 27, verse 10, and he said unto them, sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading in the ship, but also of our lives. He was warning them. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which Paul spoke. I want you to know something. This world, and I could preach in this direction, I won't go, but this world has a lot going on. And if it would just listen to the church of Jesus Christ speaking the things under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, it could save itself a lot of grief. How many could say amen to that? Verse 13, and when the south wind blew softly... Supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they loosed the ship and sailed close by Crete. So they're on their way. The wind is blowing beautiful. Everything's going to be all right. How many know if the wind's blowing beautiful, you don't know what's going to happen? If you live in the south, you understand it can be nice right now and storming in an hour. Come on. And so they think everything's going to be all right. And we're just going to go down here, verse 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind, a storm. And this type of storm is like a hurricane. Basically, it says the wind was blowing in all directions. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up under the wind, we just let it go. How many's, how many's in a ship or ever been in a ship? And I'm not talking about a, a boat. I'm talking about life that all of a sudden the winds are blowing from every, bring me down just a pinch, Caleb, if you would. The winds are blowing from every single direction. And it feels like it could be destroyed at any moment. Anybody with me on that? The winds are blowing from every direction, and sometimes in the midst of that, and in this case, they said, we're just going to let the ship go where it wants to. We're just holding on for dear life. And I felt like I've been in that boat many times in my life. I don't know about you, but sometimes we don't have control of the boat, and we just hold on and say, God, we trust you with what's going on. Anybody with me, if you are, say amen. And running under a certain island, which is called Clada, we had much work to do to the boat which when we had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, fearing lest they should fall into quicksands. We put up the sail and were driven even more. And what they did is they literally put ropes around the ship to hold it together. You know you're in trouble when the ship you're on is getting so pounded by the weather that, that you wrap ropes around it, undergirding it to keep it from blowing apart. And he says, we put the sails up and it just took off. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, verse 18, the next day we lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackle of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all our hope that we should be saved was taken away. You ever been in that place? Where you're saying, I, it's, it's dark the storm is raging. I don't know where the hope is. My hope is in him. But other than that, there's no way to get through this thing. And after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have listened to me when we left. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you. But we're going to lose the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord. I want you to listen closely whose I am and whom I serve, saying, don't be afraid, Paul. You must be brought to Caesar, and lo, God has given you all them that sail with you. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me, but we have to go to a certain island. And this is a pretty cool story, because Paul is in a place of saying, I think I'm going to die. This is the end of my rope. This, I'm not going to survive this situation. And God loves him so much, he says, oh, you're going to survive, Saul, or Paul. You're going to survive. But also understand this. The people that are around you, 
their lives are going to be spared too because of your relationship with me. Did you hear me? The people around you, their lives will be spared because of your relationship with me. Do you understand your life affects other people around you? There was a time in my mother's life, and I'm not going to go through the details, she was headed to hell as quick as she could get there. And when God saved her, he saved our whole family one by one over the last 60 years. The work that God did in the last 60 years for my mother's salvation, it's as if God said, Shirley, I'm going to save you because I have work for you to do, but those that are around you, they're going to get saved too. Come on. Don't underestimate the value of your life. You're not here, as Pastor Marcus said years ago, we didn't just get saved for ourselves, it's for other people. Your life's victory, your life's peace, your life's journey, your life's tenacity where you say, I'm going to keep fighting through this thing, will affect the lives of many other people. And you'll make it to heaven one day, and you'll stand before God, and I'm just convinced that God's going to let you know the people that you influenced or that their lives were saved because of your walk with God. Come on. You're not getting saved by yourself. You have a purpose. There are people that you've ministered to that you've never opened your mouth to because your life was the testimony for them. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. So let me go down to where I'm at here. We're going to go over to verse 39. Storm kept coming, and when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek which is like an inlet of water with a shore into the which they were minded, if it's possible, we'll get the ship in there. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves to the sea. They loosed the main rudder bands, hoisted the mainsail to the wind, and made way for shore, hoping to go through this inlet of water. But something happened on the journey. They fell into a place where two seas met. They ran the ship aground, and the fore part stuck fast, and the remainder was un and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was being broken up with the violence of the waves. You see, their world is a disaster right now. I want you to understand. This is Saul, the apostle Saul, Paul, going to be judged. And on the journey, God says, you've got to go to Rome. On the journey, all hell has broke loose. I mean, they had to go on a forced fast for about 14 days. They're on a ship that is breaking to pieces. They're in freezing cold weather. The storm is hitting. Although God's favor was with him, the journey was tough. Is anybody hearing me? The journey sometimes is really tough. And at one point they said, all hope that we'd survive this journey was, was gone. We think we're out. And then just in the nick of time, an angel says, Paul, you're going to make it. Thank God for those just-in-time words. I said this to somebody else, and I want you to hear me. Everybody wants, I want a prophetic word. You get a true prophetic word from God, it's it's not done just by happenstance. It's not done just by God's going to give you a word. If it's a true prophetic word from God, it's to strengthen you on the journey and the things that are coming your way. Come on. When someone comes to me and says, Pastor Dave, God says this and this and this about you. I already knew those things. I'm saying, why are you telling me now, God? What's coming to try to break me down? Come on. You hearing me? We want someone to give us this word. Give me a word from God. I'm going to tell you, when God gives you that word, you better put your belt on and say, why, God? Is it just to, uh, maybe just to confirm something? I like those ones. But a lot of times it's to say, you're about to go through some battles, some challenges, some things that are going to try to test your faith. Hold on to this word because I'm not giving up on you. That's what Saul was going through. He says right in the beginning, he says, we, we were about to die. All hope was gone. We we're about to get, it's going to be end. I mean, Paul might have stood up and says, hey, let's everybody give a life to Jesus because you're about to die. The ship is going down and so are you. But an angel came and said, guess what? God's not done with you yet. Guess what? God's going to give you their lives too. Just keep holding on. Are you with me? I'm going to say this. Growing in God and the journey sometimes is wonderful and easy. I like the people that say, how you doing? Life is good. God is good. 
all the time. They even made a song about that. I'm going to tell you, sometimes life is not good, and sometimes it is hard, and sometimes all you can do is hold on to the promises of God and say, I'm going to make it to the other side. Come on. And those journeys are necessary sometimes for our growth, but listen to me close, but sometimes for the growth of those that are around us watching our lives. Are you hearing me? Because I sure would like it just to be easy. But I know if I can make it through the journey, the eyes that God has focused on me will find their strength because of my faith in my Jesus. Because one day when they go through the battle of their own, they'll say, but he made it through, and if he made it through, and she made it through, guess what? I'm going to hold on, and I can make it through too. Come on. Because life is tough. We're blessed and highly favored, and it is good, but then that phone call comes, or that situation happens, or man, you, you, you're making your plans, and everything is good, and you lose your job because you get laid off, or your car motor blows up, or whatever the case may be, it's in those times that your body is sick. You grab a hold of God and say, I'm not letting go. It's the faith of others that carries us on the journey. And so God said to Saul, or to Paul, I keep calling him Saul because that was his old name, that God says to Paul, it's all right, you're going to survive this, but because you're on this boat and I got plans for you, everybody else is going to survive too. I'm giving you their lives, Paul. I bet the whole boat got saved before this journey was over, I'm just saying. Verse 39, 40, and when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves, the wind blew, uh, and verse 41, falling into the place of two seas, the front stuck, the back was out, and and the the boat was being broken to pieces. That's a bad day when you're thinking, we're going to survive, and all of a sudden the boat's being torn up. Now, I'm going to take a minute and say this. Sometimes we think God has to keep what we have together, and God says, I might want to break it to pieces. There's a message I preached years ago on this, and it was a powerful word from the Lord many years ago. And he said, the church is trying to tie itself together to keep it the way it's been all these years. But I am breaking the church apart so I can rebuild it. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Come on. The church is stuck in religion, and God says, you can tie it up all you want, but I'm going to bust the religion up because I want relationships. That's what I'm talking about. So sometimes we're trying to hold it together when God says, you can wrap all the ropes you want around it, but I'm doing a thing. You're mine, I'm with you, and I may need to break some stuff up to rebuild it. Come on. If you don't break something, it doesn't need rebuilt. It's going to stay the same way. Another message. So the soldiers decided, look, the prisoners are going to escape. Let's kill them all. Can your day get any worse? It's freezing. You've been fasting. You have no food for 14 days. Then you finally get a little bit. Then you get discouraged. You're going to die. We're all going to die. And angel says, no, hang in there. You're going to be all right, but you got to go to a certain island. I didn't know I was going to go to the island floating on some pieces of wood in frozen weather. I didn't know before I got to the island that the soldiers are going to say, we got to kill all of you. Could you imagine? They pulled the swords out. They're getting ready to just kill everybody, and you're on the boat. So the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should escape. But the centurion, the one that liked Saul, Paul, the one that was getting favor, Paul found favor in the guy because of his spirit. Listen to me close. God will not connect you with somebody by accident. There's always reasons. So just trust him on the journey. So this centurion that kind of gave favor to Paul said, no, don't kill anybody. So he saved his life. So let me read back, go back. But the centurion willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to the land. Now listen how they got to the destiny and the will of God in this situation. Everyone say they got to the will of God. Because God told Paul, you got to go to this island. Verse 44. Some of them swam, some of them floated on boards, some of them got on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to the land. Your world may feel like it's breaking up, 
The church world may feel like it's in turmoil. We may look at our government and see what's a mess going on, but God says, I am God, and if you'll trust me, I will carry you to the land. I will carry you to the destiny on pieces of what you lost. Is anybody getting that? On pieces of what you lost, on the things of the past, on the things of your present, I will carry you to your destiny on the things that seem to break up. we got to have faith to say, God, my world may be falling apart, but I'm trusting you. You've got me in the midst of this, and I may be on one board, and I may have sharks swimming around me saying, we're going to eat you. But God said, you'll make it to the shore. And if God is for you, who can be against you? The Bible says no weapon formed against you can prosper. If you're God's child, you will make it to the destiny if you just hold on to him by faith. Can I get an amen? amen. So you say, God, I'm not going to give up. Verse chapter 28. And when they had escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. King James Version means they were very nice to us. For they kindled a fire. And they received us, every one, because of the rain and because it was freezing. And I have to get this. I don't like to be cold. I'll be honest with you. We went on that uh, camping trip, and I brought a sleeping bag. And, man, poor Jeremy was, like, laying on the ground. Um, I gave him my blanket, but not my bag. I just couldn't do it. And uh, he was down there frozen, and Cy was covered up head to toe. And I'm laying in my sleeping bag, and I said, oh, man, this is so warm. It got, so, it got so bad, um, honestly, I had to unzip it to get some of the cold air in by my feet because I was just getting too hot in that thing. And they're over there shivering. I thought, thank you, God, for my sleeping bag. I don't know if I was right with God or not on any of that, but, it was, but I enjoyed it. The cold is not nice. And if you're trying to do what God wants you to do and you're being a faithful servant and you're serving him and you're doing everything, but the ship that you're on looks like it's falling to pieces and, and the, 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 the wind is hammering on it and it won't let up. And, and you're, you're going through things saying, God, how do I even survive this? I don't know if I'm going to make it. And God says, yeah, you will. Keep going. And you think it's going to get better because he says you're going to make it. But no, it's getting worse. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And the ship is starting to shake, and, and all of a sudden you say, I think I see the answer. We'll go in that sea right there, put the sail up, and we're going to get right through there. We'll probably be safe in there. No, we got in there, and we got stuck, and then the ship is falling to pieces. And about the time we're saying, God, what do we do? They're getting ready to kill us, and then the guy says, jump overboard, swim for your life, and everybody dives in what? Nice, warm water? No, freezing cold, stormy water. And they're freezing to death trying to get to the shore. And I wonder how many men on the journey said, I don't think I can make it, but God said you can. How many people are just holding on? This guy swimming, can I grab a hold of the, the, the piece you're floating on? And two men trying to swim across, just trying to barely make it to the shore, just to survive. Sometimes it's that way. We can have faith, we can trust God, but he allows us to go through stormy waters sometimes, and it is hard. But he's saying, keep on. Don't give up. If you stay here, you will die. Just go forward. I prepared a way. You might not like the way. You might not like the journey. You might not like the conditions, but I'm in it. Just get there. Come on. And so they show up there, and they, they have fire for them, and it's warm. And uh, I love verse 3. And when Paul, getting warmed up, gathered a bundle of sticks, he laid them on the fire. You know, you feel like, wow, we survived. We made it through. Whew. Thank you, God. And now your Christian comes up and says, I'm going to go serve the people around here. I'm going to get some wood and throw it on a fire because I'm a servant of God. And you throw it on the fire and all of a sudden a poisonous snake, a poisonous snake comes out of the fire and it snatches a hold of you and it says, it didn't bite him, by the way. It didn't just bite him. It fastened on his hand. There's a big difference. A bite is a, bam, ow, that hurt, wow. But fastening, I gotcha. And I'm not letting go. You survived the boat, 
You survived the cold. You survived your world falling apart. But now I've got you. And I'm biting into you. And I am fastened on you so strong you're not going to shake me off or get rid of me. You know, I just like to look up origins of words sometimes. And do you know what that word fastened means? Let me just, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but this is a bad day. (laughs) It's a bad day. (laughs) The boat we're on is floating in the water in pieces. This is bad. And now, as a servant of God, God's, the angel said, you're going to be all right, Paul. I've got work for you to do, and now I'm bit with a snake. That's supposed to kill me. Are, Are you hearing me? That doesn't make sense. So this serpent comes out and latches on his hand. And if you look at the word fastened in the root word of the original Greek, it's the same connection as becoming one with somebody. Matter of fact, it's the same Greek word, if you studied out, for a husband and wife to be intimate, to produce a child. Pretty strange, huh? Because that serpent said, I want to be one with you, and I'm not leaving. I'm latched on. I'm not letting go. I'm not going to let go. It's at that point, Paul could have said, you know what? Enough is enough. I give up. This is crazy. I might as well go ahead and die. Where are you, God? I'm telling you, God does not leave us on the journey. He's standing there, but sometimes we got to get snake bit. Sometimes the ship's got to break. Sometimes we got to go through the cold. Sometimes we got to think we're going to die. And God's saying, that's all okay. Just trust me. I have not given up on you yet. Can I get an amen? amen. So we have this serpent that's connected. And I just gave this serpent a name. I said, the serpent of past failures wants to stay connected. Anybody hearing me? You think you're getting ahead and all of a sudden a memory or someone does something and that serpent bites you and wants to put its fangs in you and become one with you so that it can destroy your future because it's your past. Past failures, the serpent of rejection, the serpent of hurts, The serpent of abandonment, the serpent of weaknesses in sin or temptations. This serpent says, I'm holding on to you. The serpent of failure, the serpent of self-hatred. Anybody with me? The serpent of, you're not going to make it. And right when you think you get out of the worst of it, you're bit with this serpent. And the serpent is always symbolic of the devil. And he comes and says, I'm going to latch on to you. And I'm going to hold on to you. And I don't care what you do in your future. I'm hanging on and I'm not going to let go. I'm in it for the long haul, the devil says. I'm in it to destroy you, to kill you, and to steal from you. And we've got two options. Allow that serpent to stay on because I believe Saul or Paul would have continued on his journey. He could have went to Rome with a snake hanging on his hand. He could have said, hey, let me tell you about my Jesus, how good he is. He's a healer with a snake hanging on his hand. But somewhere in this, the body of Christ has to make a decision. Will I allow the serpent to continue to abide on my life or will I shake this thing off back in the fire from where it came? Come on. Thank you for that hand clap. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, here's what they said. No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffers not for him to live. He's going to die. Let me tell you, every assignment of hell that the enemy means for evil, God can use for your good and for his good. Come on. And he made the decision to shake off the beast in the fire. Now, I don't know how the fangs of a snake work. I used to hunt rattlesnakes when I was a kid. I just shot them. But I don't know what it feels like to have a serpent hanging on my hand. I would assume you just don't go like this. I would assume it's a little more than this. I would assume, I mean, this thing wasn't dead, it was alive. I would assume you'd have to grab that joker and rip it off and just shake it and shake it and throw it in the fire. That's what I would assume you have to do. Some of you look at me like I'm crazy, but you do that with a spider. 
You beat yourself up. You're going crazy. What can you imagine? A snake that is venomous, that is going to kill you, should kill you, is latched, fastened deep into your hand. You got to grab that living joker. You got to grab him around the head and you got to rip him off and you got to pull the fangs out and throw him in the fire and say, God, I'm going to live and not die. Come on. Sometimes it's not easy to get the serpent that has attached to us that says, I want to integrate. I want to be one. I want to hold your life in my mouth. Sometimes we've got to take that thing and rip it off of us and say, you're not controlling my destiny. So he shook off the beast in the fire and he felt no harm. What a powerful promise of God that the assignment of the enemy cannot destroy your destiny and your call of God. Howbeit they looked when, they, when he, he should have swollen or fell down dead suddenly. But after that, he didn't. In a great while, they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds. Don't you just love it? The people that were watching his life changed their minds. And instead of saying he's a murderer, now they're saying he's a god. You don't think God can't take the mess that we have in our lives and turn it around where people look at us and say, that's a symbol of God. That's somebody to understand, to follow. Are you hearing me? I got that in my spirit saying this thing latched, and when I looked it up, it's, I, it said it, it wanted to become one, and God's saying, no, don't do it. Now, I want to make a shift here, and we're going to go to the book of Hebrews, and then we're going to make a declaration. So the book of Hebrews... Hebrews chapter uh, 3 and 4. This is something the Lord, and I know this is kind of more of a teaching than a preaching today. I can't help myself. It's just been burning in my spirit. Hebrews chapter 3, starting at verse 7, and then we're going to go to chapter 4. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, chapter 3, verse 7, today if you will hear his voice, listen now, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works for 40 years. And he's in reference to the children of Israel for 40 years living in the wilderness. And, and this, is, uh, this is staggering to me, uh, the children of Israel, because um, I want to say this. And I'm not going to read you the scriptures for the sake of time. But God's people came out of Egypt after 400 years. And they, they uh, had some doubt problems. They didn't grab a, by faith in the God that was for them. And God had proven himself to them. So let me tell you uh, what God uh, did for them. Um, their, their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. Did you hear me? Their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. Their clothes didn't wear out. They never dry rotted 40 years. I mean, what does that mean in 40 years? That means the hand-me-downs were big time. I mean, this kid's now 10, 11 years old. Now he's 12, 13, just passed the clothes down. They didn't have to make any clothes. They had no sickness ever came towards them. When they were thirsty, water came out of a rock. God made water come out of a rock. They were hungry, and God says, I'm going to give you bread every day. Literally, manna came up on the ground for them to eat. They didn't have to shop. They didn't have to go work. All they had to do was just enjoy. Then they got tired of the man and said, God, we're sick of bread. We want this cracker bread looking thing. We want some, some meat. So God says, okay. So he sent quail to land. Every day they had meat. In the daytime, a cloud covered them in the shade to cover them. And at nighttime, a fire came to warm them up and protect them. The armies feared them. They were so protected by God, but yet they didn't receive him by faith. Someone says, if God would just do this, I'd believe. No, you have to believe, and God will just do this. 
Let me finish this. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, says the Lord. This is chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. I was grieved with that generation. I said, do they always err in their heart? And they have not known my way. So I swear in my wrath, they will not enter into my promises. Take heed, therefore, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He's he's warning the church, saying, don't be like them. Caden, you can come on when you're ready. I want to go down to verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in to God's promises because of unbelief. You with me? Last two verses, and I'm going to wrap it up. And these are the verses that have just jumped into my spirit in the last two weeks. Let us therefore fear, chapter 4, lest the promise being left for us of entering into his rest that we would fall short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Listen to me close. Last verse of the day. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Everyone say the word did not profit them. You see, the words that I spoke to you today cannot profit you unless you mix it with faith to receive. We gave a beautiful word for Dalton. We gave words for other people. God's doing some things. This is a powerful day in the Lord. Everything God does. I can, maybe I, when I mentioned about your, you feel like your ship is broken and, you know, the waves and the sea and are you going to survive but you're going to make it to the shore. All this is good. But you have to apply faith. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. You see, we have to come to the place where we apply faith to what God says. Are you hearing me? What kind of faith? I believe what he says, faith in the one that said it. Are you hearing me? I can't just have faith in my faith. Faith in my faith is just just what they say on TV. You just got to believe. Believe in what? Believe it's going to happen. Okay, I believe it's going to happen, but I need to believe in something greater than just it might happen. I got to believe in the one that can make it happen. Jesus said, without faith, we can't please God. Those that believe in him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by faith the elders obtain great reports. You see, church, we've got to step into the place of a declaration of faith in our life. How many's ever heard somebody, I'm I'm setting you up on this. How many's ever heard somebody else in this church speak negative things? Raise your hand. Oh, you guys are scaredy cats. Oh, my Lord. Marcus, we need a repentance. How many in this church has heard somebody around you or near you or across the aisle, somebody say something negative? Come on. Everybody in here is going to raise your hand. And watch this one. Put your hand. How many has never said anything negative in your life? Raise your hand. <laughs> you guys are too easy. Busted. It's easier to speak negative things than it is positive things. It's easy to destroy instead of pick up. It's easier to say, I'm not going to make it than I am going to make it. It's easier for Paul to say, I think we're all going to die. And harder for him to say, nobody's going to die. Jump in this sea. I don't care if it's freezing, if there's sharks. We're going to make it because God said it. You see, when we put faith in God's word, it changes everything. We've got to learn how to start speaking life and not death. The Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. Come on. We've got to get this change of mind. We walk around and what we see affects us and that's how we respond. I think I'm going to die today. Oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen. They're going to take everything I got. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to fail in school. Anybody with me? And God's saying, you're not a failure. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're with me. So someone sent this to me or Sister Tammy or somebody 
I just want to read this to you, and I'm going to close. It's called personal confession. What if you did something like this every day? You could write your own. Are you ready? Here we go. I'm going to read it fast because it's a lot. I set the course of my life today with my words. I declare today that I will not be defeated. I will not be discouraged. I will not be depressed or disappointed today. I am the head. I have insight. I have wisdom. I have ideas. I have authority. I exercise my authority today with my words, and I decree a thing that it is so. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. As I speak words today, they come to pass. They go before me. They bring the things to pass that I desire, and they stop all attacks, assaults, oppression, and fear from coming to my life. God is on my side today, therefore I cannot be defeated. His favor surrounds me today as a shield. I expect favor today from heaven and from earth. Jesus had favor with God and man, and he... And as he said, is so am I on the earth. In other words, I'm grabbing his blessings. Therefore, I have favor today with God and man. I expect to receive favor in my home, favor in my job, favor in my business, favor in my ministry, favor in my finances, favor in every deal I'm involved in. I have the wisdom of God today. I think the right thoughts. I say the right words. I make the right decisions. Every situation I face today. My mouth speaks wisdom, and my heart is filled with understanding. I ask for and receive an abundant supply of wisdom and understanding today from God. Wisdom from above, wisdom that is pure, wisdom that is peaceable, wisdom that is gentle and unwavering, will, willing to yield without hypocrisy. Wisdom and understanding are better than silver and gold, and nothing I desire can compare with them. Therefore, I will make it my ambition and desire to have understanding and wisdom. Therefore, I know I will have all of the other desires of my heart. My words go before me in securing my divine health and healing. I will not be sick today. I will not be sad today. I will not be broke today. I will not be confused today. I have health today. I have joy today. I have all the money I need in the name of Jesus. My steps are ordered by the Lord. I have a covenant with God, and by the blood of Jesus, I release my divine protection and divine provision. My angels are carrying out the word of God on my behalf. That's just declaring some things. One time I gave a word from the Lord to a group of people, and I said, God says for you to declare before him his promises. And so they did. And God said, tell them now I can't do it. I said, what? He said, tell them their negativity blocks the blessing. Because negativity and doubt is faithlessness. Are you hearing me? So although I'm declaring the blessings of God with my mouth, I'm shutting them off. God's going to supply my need. He is my Jehovah Jireh. He's my Jehovah Rophe. I don't have anything and I think I'm going to die. I feel so sick. Anybody hearing me? We got bitter water and sweet water coming out of the same mouth saying, I declare the blessings of God and now I'm going to take them off the map. And God said, as long as the negativity is in there, that's faithlessness, and I'm blocked from blessing you. Come on. I'm almost done. I receive supernatural strength and encouragement from God and my angels. Angels carry out the Word of God, and every word that I speak that lines up with the Word of God is being carried out by angels even now as I speak. I expect to have divine appointments today, to run with the right people and to be delivered from wrong people. Any adversary attack, accidents, and tragedies that were headed my way are diverted right now by the name of Jesus. I speak to the raging waters of my life and I say, peace be still. I say to the emotions and uh, I speak to my emotions, peace be still. I say to my mind, peace be still. I say to my body, peace be still. I say to my home, peace be still. I say to my family, peace be still. Now I speak every mountain of fear, every mountain of discouragement, every mountain of stress, every mountain of depression, every mountain of lack and insufficiency. And I say, be removed and cast into the sea in Jesus' name. I expect the best day of my life spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and financially today in the name of Jesus Christ. 
come on. Somewhere we've got to begin to say, God, I take your word and I declare in faith, I cut off the negativity, I cut off the fear. The journey may be hard. I may be in the sea. It may be freezing. A snake might bite me, but I am still God's. And if God be for me, who can be against me? He's got a destiny and I will fulfill his plan. Come on, stand to your feet and give the Lord the biggest shout of praise you can. Come on. Father, we praise you. Lord, we will not speak negative things anymore. We will declare the word of the Lord and his promises. Our kids shall serve you. Our nation will come back to you. The finances will turn around. Lord, our blessing rests on us because of you. Greater are you than he that's in the world. In Jesus' matchless name. And we all said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. We love you. God bless you. Hug somebody's neck. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them you love them. And we'll see you tomorrow night.